Come on, Jose! Good morning, Woo! church! Good morning. Good morning. Can you please go to Luke 10? Yes. Yeah. We'll start from 17 to 20. And so my titles and my only point is the greatest hope gives the greatest joy. Woo! And so this is amazing. You know, before we start reading in verse 17 and verse 1 to 2 in Luke 10 of chapter 10, we see Jesus gathering the 72 disciples. And, he, and I can just imagine, he takes them to a mountain maybe and shows them the, the land. He's like, guys, the harvest is plentiful, but we need workers. And so they pray, he, he, he opens his eyes and realizes the 72 disciples are actually the workers. Oh, and so he sends them out. But now in verse 17, we see their reaction when they come back. So let's start in verse 17. Oh, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice if the spirits submit to you, but rejoice if your names are written in heaven. Wow. You know, that is amazing. Like, I can just imagine the 72 coming to Jesus like, Jesus, did you see that? This demon submit to me. Like, you start flexing and saying, you know how much great they are. Like, oh, this, this guy wanted to repent, and he repented. This guy wanted to get baptized. It was amazing. And, and Jesus doesn't, like, you know, high-five them or, or shake their hands and tell them how great, a, a great job they've done. Rather, he says, Satan fell, fell, fell from heaven. Okay. And he says, but guess what? Your names are in heaven. He tells his disciples to rejoice that their names are in heaven rather than what they can do. Mm. You see, Jesus knew that the disciples were joyful because they have put their hope in something they can see, but also in something they can have control of. And that's not hope. You know, hope is to have a positive expectation of the future, not the present. Therefore, your joy is from the future and not the present. And, and as disciples, we can sometimes put our hope in, in things that are happening, you know, in things that are, that are happening, happening right now, and things that we can control of, and things that we can do. But, you know, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, let's, let's, be, let's be hopeful about baptisms. You know, let's be hopeful about Bible studies, about our ministry here in Dallas, about our goals and our future. But that's not where we, get, that's not where we should get our joy from. Yeah. Yeah. That's not our fuel. That's not our gasoline, so to say. Wow. And, and I love it. You know, Jesus tells us it's simple. Put your hope in heaven. Wow. Why? Because that's the greatest hope you can have. Like, why? Because when we, when we think about that, like we rejoice that our names are written in heaven as disciples. And when, when I read that, I think about the day I got baptized. Come on. Like, it's amazing. This month and last month, it's just, if you've been on Groovy, like birthday parties, like, I mean, um, <laughs> birthdays and also spiritual birthdays. Yeah. But also this month on the 23rd, I do two years in the Lord. Woo! Man. And, and I can just remember when I made my good confession, when, when I decided to become a disciple and get baptized. And at that point, I got my sins forgiven. Yeah. I, I entered to the kingdom, to God's church and family. I received the Holy Spirit, but also my name was written in heaven. Wow, wow. I, I just came out of those waters, pure joy. Yes. And, and I don't know if you remember your baptism. Yeah, it was well. joyful, amen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. But the question is, are you joyful today as you were when you got baptized? Wow. You know, where are you putting your hope in? And, and things you can control of, or are you putting your hope in heaven? You know, do you think about the cross? Like, do you just think about the cross on Sundays for communion? Or, think, or do you think about it every day? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because what you think is, is what you become. Yeah. Yeah. So if you put your hope in the greatest hope, which is heaven, you'll receive the greatest joy. Yeah. And I love it. We have to be joyful, but sometimes it's hard. <laughs> Life is hard. And so I want to encourage you guys with the scripture in James 1. So we'll read verse 2 to 4. And it says, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, this is amazing. It just tells us, hey, have pure joy, and life in yep. general, like in anything. And when I think about that, I was like, wow, what if we all just just received a million bucks each month? Woo! Like, yes! Pure like, joy. Yeah, pure joy right there. Like, all we have to do is just live life. You know, eat, wake up, 
go through live and challenges, and, and at the end of the month, we get a million bucks. Whoa, that's awesome. That's awesome. Like, you feel like a million bucks, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but do you rejoice like a million bucks when you put your hope in heaven? Wow. Yeah. How much more value should we put in heaven? Yeah. You know? And when we stop being joyful, we start being bitter towards God. Ooh. Like, to bitter, bitter towards the people because, you know, this challenge in my life, and I gotta wake up early in the morning, and, and you know, all these stuff. And then we can sometimes go back to our sin when, when, we have, when we have so much pressure in our lives. We gotta have a joyful perspective about the future. Come on. Yeah. And I love what James says. It says, it says to have pure joy. And you know, when I think about pure joy, I think about organic, like authentic, pure, original. And I think about like drinking water in the desert. Oh, yes. And not just water, but like fresh, cold yes. water. And when you like throw that baby down your throat, like, it, it, it is refreshing, yes. it's easy, it's satisfying. Mm -hmm. And actually the definition of joyful is the feeling of great pleasure and happiness. So the satisfaction that the hope gives you should be enough for you to go through your day. Yeah. But it's, it's the satisfaction that the heavy gives you should be enough for you to go throughout your week. Yes. Yeah. It has to be an honest joy. Uh, honest joy. Come on. You know? So brothers and sisters, consider pure joy. When your car is stuck in the highway, you're sweating. <laughs> uh, consider pure joy. When you don't have visitors in your Bible talk. When the person you have been studying the Bible does not want to repent and be baptized. When the brother or sister is struggling, when you face persecution, and consider it pure joy when the challenges of life happen. Why? Because our hope is in heaven. You know, it's time to set our eyes in heaven. It's time to set our hope in God. Let's rejoice like a million bucks because the greatest hope Gives the greatest joy to God through the glory. Come on! Be patient in affliction. If you could please turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, the title of my short little charge is Misery and Misfortune Misunderstood. And I'll be talking about you know the expect expectation, the reaction, and the solution for our struggles. Wow. In 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 12, it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery or ordeal that has come to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of the glory in the God rests on you. If you suffer, it should be as a, it shouldn't be as a, as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And we'll stop there. Come on, bro. So as we can see, you know, suffering is to be expected. If you are surprised about the trials and tribulations in your life as a disciple, perhaps you didn't take the necessary time out to count the cops of what it means to be a disciple. In Luke 14, 27, Jesus says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Are we bearing our own cross? When it, what it means to bear our own cross comes with the suffering. You know, we, we are willing to suffer just like Jesus did. Um, and and how, do, how do we react to suffering? You know, I feel like there's three common ways we react to suffering as disciples. One of them is we fight against it. We retaliate against everybody around us. We want everybody to feel as miserable as we do by our own hands. You know, this is the saying we give um, commonly in our discipleship relationships is hurt people hurt people. Yeah. You know, a second way we can, can react to it is we try to run from it. You know, we, we want to just hide from it so it doesn't expose our heart because we're scared, we're fearful. Um, we become, you know, just cowardly and, and we become in, in, in a stage of fright and flight. Yeah. Um, and a third way I feel is the most common way that we, we add to suffering and affliction is we become discouraged. Yeah. We become sad. We start saying things like, God, why me? Why are you doing this to me? Life is so hard. Life is so unfair. You're right. Life is really unfair. You know, it was unfair that Jesus 
suffered his entire life from the day he was conceived. Before marriage, a scandalous situation to the day we murdered him on the cross. That was unfair. It's unfair that Jesus, um, he lived his life, he lived and died for us. Um, so we can continue to this day, you know, play the victim, saying that, oh, I, I'm the victim, my life is hard. That's unfair. Um, we are not the victims. We are the offenders. Yes. Um, so let's, let's stop thinking just about ourselves and more about Christ, about what he went through, so we can live the life that we have now. Um, and, and the perfect example of how we should react to suffering is just Jesus. He's the perfect example. He went through so much that he did not complain once. Probably just once, uh, uh, just, God, you know, if, it, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. You know, I'm just going to check before. But even then, he prayed yes. so much. He did not complain when his best friends abandoned him, when he was whipped and flogged, you know, just countless times. He did not complain at all. He was joyous throughout all the affliction. Okay. How we should rejoice, I mean, how should we react to suffering is just one, one, one thing, just rejoice. Yeah. You know, in uh, 1 Peter 4, 13, it says we should rejoice. We even get the chance to share in the sufferings of Christ. Suffering in the name of Christ shows that we are blessed. We should praise God that we get the mercy to suffer rather than just to perish. Um, and, and I'll let you guys on a big secret. You know, regardless of whether we're a disciple or not, we're going to have suffering in our lives. Yeah. True. You know, so what's the point? Like, why are we making excuses as disciples? Like, oh, my life is so hard. I want to run away from the responsibilities of a disciple. Why are we making that, that excuse? Because we're spiritually weak. Yeah. You know, we only make excuses about all the suffering in our lives because we're spiritually weak. Stop making excuses about the responsibilities as a disciple because it's hard. You know, that's just like saying that Jesus dying on the cross was easier than what we're going through. Wow. I, and I see nobody here hanging from a cross today. Wow. You know, um, I, I have a challenge for anybody who, anybody who feels this way. You know, just I challenge you, just get together with your disciple as soon as possible awesome. so you can just be open about it. Yeah. You know, Get that help to find your joy because if you have lost sight of joy and in the times of struggles, you have lost sight of God because God is our joy. Yeah. Um, if we have been afflicted by anything in our lives, God is that 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 um, answer to men to really take away that affliction. There's no other way. Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. This is the calling for us not to just rejoice without affliction, without yeah. suffering, you know, but it's the calling for us to rejoice. Um, it's in spite of our, our uh, in spite and because of our suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, they right. coincide with each other. Wow. You know, so brothers and sisters, let's continue our race <coughs> with patience and faith um, to overcome any trials that come in our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, because in the end, we will be overjoyed when His glory is yeah, revealed. And to God, be the glory. First of all, good morning, and uh, thank you guys for giving me an opportunity. It's an honor to just speak to you guys. Amen? What a week. Um, the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is Romans 12, 12. Amen? And uh, as, as we heard from uh, Jose and Darian, be, hopeful in, uh, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Amen? I'm going to focus on faithful in prayer. And, uh, you know, uh, faith in prayer. Um, I, I thought about it, and, and faith has everything to do with prayer. Yeah. Um, when things don't seem to be going the way that we want them to, um, especially those times, right? It, it, that, that's when faith really comes, is necessary for us to pray. You know, I had such, um, this past week has been really, really such a challenging week. Last Sunday, didn't get to come to church. Um, woke up uh, Saturday, Nathan started to get sick, um, found out he had a respiratory virus. For parents out there, those respiratory viruses, yeah. It can become pneumonia. It can just trans. It can evolve to anything else. Yeah. We ended up not coming, not being able to go to church. Took him to urgent care. He couldn't breathe. Um, you know, he made a turn for the. He did, he missed school on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday, we finally got him to school. Come come back uh, from work. Aaron brings Connor with me. He's breathing. Literally, his chest is going in. Like it, it, it's almost as if his cavity is going in. He can't breathe. He got a respiratory virus on Wednesday. 
right with Nathan. Oh. So we have to take him to urgent care Wednesday night. Um, you know, it, you know, Friday um, we came back, realized that my AC went out. Now I have two sick children, one car, no AC. Broke down. Still have to make Bible talk happen. Um, Saturday morning woke up, Nathan's ear is now swollen. He had an ear infection yesterday. So we took him back to urgent care. It's our third time going to urgent care in one week. Wow. Um, Man, what a week, amen? <laughs> but you talk about hope and patience, and uh, I think this was amazing. Um, thank you, Tyler, for, for prayer, faithful in prayer. Because um, So if you've ever felt overwhelmed, uh, tired, weary, I can relate. Amen. I know exactly how you feel. Um, they're home right now, still recovering, um, but, but keep them in your prayer. Ironically, um, these are the times, these tough and challenging times, when we need the most prayer. Yeah. We need the most prayer. And there's nothing more, more, you know, uh, 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 it's scary, you know, it, it, it is terrifying, more terrifying than seeing a, a two or four year old uh, get sick. Um, for the parents, you guys know, it's scary because you just don't know. They can't speak, they can't communicate. Oh. Yeah. So over the years, um, what I'm realizing is, as disciples, over the years, we can allow these trials, the challenges, and the setbacks to discourage us from having the conviction that prayer is the most powerful thing we can do. Yeah. Unfortunately, this week, I was not the most prayerful. I felt as though I needed to attack the problem instead of going to God in prayer. You know, um, a lot of times, I realize that I can become really faithless. That's why it says you've got to be faithful in prayer. I can become really faithless. I tend to muscle my way through the different situations instead of praying through them. I go through the hardships and challenges, but I do not prayerfully work through my heart. And I miss on the opportunity of gaining understanding. It's the worst thing you can do is to go through hard times and not pray through it. Because you miss out on just all the opportunities of revelations and just understanding that you can get from those times. Yeah. Now, you may say, no, I believe that prayer is powerful. Okay, how much and how often do you get on your knees and pray? That really says a lot about what we yeah. believe, the power of prayer. Do you believe with all your heart that God will answer your prayers? That he has the power to accomplish anything? Okay, you may say, you know, that you believe that God can answer anything. Chances are, there is one thing. Um, and it may be several things, guys. That, and you know what that thing is that you started praying for at this beginning of this year that you're no longer praying for. Wow. You stopped. I, you know what it is. It may be several things. Maybe you went through February, March, but somewhere along the line, faithlessness crept in. You didn't see things come into fruition. You stopped praying. As a, a reason that we stop praying is because we, we simply become faithless. Because prayer takes time. Prayer takes time. In both sense of the word, right? Prayer requires the seconds, the minutes, and the hours of the day. You literally have to stop, take some time out, and pray. But it also takes time. It takes years sometimes, right? How much do you pray? Um, you know, Jesus said in Luke 18, verse 1, he said, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable show them that, to show them that they should always pray and not give up. I can assume that Jesus understood that we oftentimes will give up. Some prayers don't come into fruition until the very last minute. But we miss out on it because we stop. Amen? Amen? Jesus knew that something would discourage the disciples from praying. And one of those elements is time, the delayed response. Sometimes God does things on his own time. And that sometimes can really kill our faith if we don't hold on and persevere. Amen? Amen. How about you this morning? You know, this woman, this, 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 this widow in, in, in Luke 18, she kept persistently going to the judge to get a resolution. And she would not stop. But, and, it, and it didn't matter how much time. And, uh, you know, prayer is, is, I believe, one of the most important remedy that a disciple possesses. Yes. In Colossians 4 verse 2, the Bible says, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. You know, if, again, if there was a week that I lacked the most prayer, it was probably this week. Sadly, 
Um, it was until the last minute, um, you know, the end of the week that I started to intentionally think and reach out in prayer to God. In my mind, I can often think that I can take care of the issue myself. Just give, you know, me enough time to think through it, I'll figure it out. I can sinfully think to myself, what is prayer going to do right this second? I'll, I'll get to it later. Not realizing that prayer has, the prayer has a greater purpose in our lives instead of the instant results. It has a greater purpose, right? Here's the truth. Prayer actually helps us tremendously, but we forget. We have spiritual amnesia. We forget. You know, prayer helps me to a few things I want to list. It helps me to process. It helps me to heal. It helps me to express and communicate. It helps me to endure. It helps me to persevere. Prayer helps us to discern. It helps us to refine our perception. It enhances our spiritual senses, and it revives our souls. Prayer softens our hearts and it cleanses the spirit and it protects the mind. I mean, you talk about remedies. Prayer is the remedy for almost anything in your life this morning. Amen? Amen. Jesus, think about it, who's God himself, prayed because he knew he needed prayer. Hezekiah prayed for healing. Jesus prayed for strength. Joshua prayed for deliverance. And Abraham prayed for a miracle. A son. Amen? Amen? Prayer is a friend to hope and patience which Jose and Darian just gave us here. And you cannot have hope without prayer, and you cannot endure patiently in affliction without prayer. There's no way. Difficult times does not and should not excuse us from prayer. The most important reason to pray is to express ourselves to God and to find communion with Him. Amen? Amen. A great example of someone who prayed fervently and reverently to God was David. And if you look at Psalms 86, verse 1 to 10, we're not going to have time. He really expresses himself how awesome and amazing God is. But one of the most incredible things um, about, prayer, about David was that he prayed with his heart and all his strength and mind. And through prayer, this is the only way you can fall in love with God. Amen. It really is. There's no way to really fall in love with God without prayer. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning. Make a list of all the things that you once prayed for and recommit yourself to them. They can happen. When you feel any type of emotion, express those feelings and sentiments to God. God will come through and give us strength. God, there's, guys, there's no more, there's nothing else that's as powerful. Jesus knew it. He prayed most of the time. Uh, very few times you saw Jesus go and read his Bible in, in tough times. He was the word, but he prayed yeah. because he knew that's where the deliverance came. Yeah. Let's be persistent in prayer yeah. to God in glory. Amen. Woo!